All right, in this episode, which is not an RPG a Day 2021 episode, another interlude, if you will, I take calls from Jason and Barney, and I answer them. So there you go, Jason, I answer your question from the other podcast that you left in the other podcast episode, and I go into more detail about social combat and Game of Thrones and what that means, maybe. There is also a, another recap of my ongoing Warhammer Fantasy RPG 4 game where we're playing the enemy within, and again, antics ensue because that's the way the players are, that's the way the play seems to go. I think we're just maybe all excited to be back at the table again. It's still very novel and new, and this adventure has not gotten old. And I just sometimes just present what's going on and sit back and let the players do their thing, which is kind of a cool way to play. Carl, I'm four minutes into your interludes uh, episode, and you talk about not being railroad or have more free will free will unless we're in a social combat that we lose and we have to drink poison and kill ourselves huh huh okay i might finish the episode tonight probably not because i've got to talk to my wife so i well, guess i'll I, I suffer and drive the van tomorrow experience. not get to ride my bike just so i can finish your episode i hope you feel guilty no i don't actually i hope you're doing well i hope amy's doing well and maybe I'll see you next week. Talk to you later. Hey, Jason, clearly a game like A Song of Ice and Fire would not be the game for you. So in response to your comment, when you are defeated in combat or social conflict in the rules in A Song of Ice and Fire, then you basically are at the dictates of the winner. So, and the players were fine with that. That's what they signed up for. They knew the rule or the way the procedure went. And I guess they're cool with it because, see, if they win, then, like, he could have had, in the social conflict, for example, he could have had the Black Widow of Casterly Rock betray her liege lord. So, and then in the case of combat, if when you defeat your foe, you can either capture them or kill them, right? They're under your control. I mean, the, the game recommends, for example, in combat, you capture them, but it just depends on the conflict. And, you know, players don't like taking prisoners. They just kill them. So that's generally what happens. But, uh, you know, it's the world has to be consistent. And yes, while the players can be the stars of a show, if they fail, well... They um, live in ignominy, I guess. That's the way you say that word. So it's an interesting mechanic, and maybe that's why it hasn't caught on, because there can be, just like in the books, harsh consequences for failure. Maybe that's what the authors were trying to get at. But I know that Shadow of the Demon Lord is not merciful either in its mechanics, so that's probably something that Robert Schwab decided to do when he was designing A Song of Ice and Fire. And honestly, most players got on board with it and they understood it. And at, and at the table, while I was, as a GM, I was planning to be merciful, the other players were like, nope, those are the consequences. It wouldn't be right if you had won and you had done, had the NPC done X. So it was really the players who piled on as it were, in that particular case. And the way that the character creation works is all the players are from the same house. Um, so I guess if the player had wanted to come back, he would have made another character within that house. Or at least, if not necessarily that house, then, um, well, no, I think it's they just come from the same house for the most part. You could do... Alternatively, you could have players come from different houses, but then you have to have them each make their own house, which would be kind of a pain. So I don't think that would necessarily work, just logistically. And if that 
that wasn't part of their, if they didn't buy into that, well, I mean, I can always get other players, right? Um, did that happen with this guy? I'm not sure if that happened with this guy. It was a while ago. But um, the other, like I said, the other big issue in the game was the players not understanding the combat mechanic. And even though explained to them and shown to them in examples uh, before, they, before play, that much like Riddle of Steel or Rune Quest, when you're defending or attacking other parties, then you have to defend yourself um, and split your ability when you defend yourself. So the player did not understand that, charged a group of armed men, thought that he had the chops, and people were like, no, that's a bad idea. So it's not like the other players aren't telling this person. You know, they're, they're not letting him, well, they let the person make the decision, of course, but they say, they do counsel that this is a bad idea. And I also counsel that's probably not a good idea. Player did it anyway, because I don't know why. Um, thinking, I guess, that it was like other games where that doesn't happen. Everything is equal when you attack X, Y, and Z, but that's not the case here. And, or that's not the way this mechanic works. Your, your dice pools are split up um, as needed. So if you don't save dice for um, an at oncoming attack, you can't defend against it, right? So um, that's what happened. Focus all on one and defense on one. And um, well, that led to a lot of stabby stabbies and much gouts of blood and another character dead. So that's, I don't know, it's a different style of game. It's a harsh world um, and that's okay. Because a lot of players seem to like that, and it just you know scheduling and people moving away is probably what led to the the demise. Truth be told, not not players all getting up and rage quitting. In fact, they had wanted to continue because I think everyone wanted to see well, what is our house going to do? And the proverbial head is chopped from the block. I'm so pleased that you enjoyed League of Eternal Guardians. It was great to have the chance to play with you. It was great to play Alluvial Plains with you a while back. And um, I was always hoping that we would get to pick that up again. But I guess um, I guess we, we haven't quite got round to that yet. But I still, uh, I still have in mind that you would like to do some tribe creation, some world building. So I'm really excited that we get back to that. But League of Eternal Guardians, just to answer your little thought, absolutely it's meant to be humorous and gonzo or wacky or whatever. Um, I, I, I kind of struggle to, to, to think of serious systems but also on you know parallel to that i really want as much freedom for players as possible so i really try to build that into the mechanics so yeah bye hey barney glad i got that right that is the vibe i felt for the league game and I'm glad that the tone and flavor are wild and wacky and definitely want to play some more Olivia Plains. I think that game is serious. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like it's a serious survival type game that takes place in these prehistoric Olivia Plains, right? In Paleolithic times, if that's right, if I recall correctly. Or maybe it was Mesolithic, I don't know. It's an ancient type game, pre-civilization, pre was very cool and something I've always wanted to do. And I'm glad that you have that, that game out there and we got to schedule and do that. Um, but I also want to play some more League and I want my um, Titus Pillow, Edward Teach, Ray Stevenson character to do more fun things. So hopefully we'll get that together as well. 
Again, thanks for the call and looking forward to uh, playing more and hearing more about your game. Ah, uh, that train whistle. You know what that means? That means it's time for gaming recaps. And that train whistle is for Jason Connerly, who always accuses me of railroading characters into oblivion. So I had talked about one game already, the Iron Kingdom's 5e game that I ran this week, and I ran another game. And that was our live play of Warhammer Fantasy, our uh, Warhammer Fantasy, the fourth edition, and we're playing the Enemy Within campaign, we're in Enemy of the Shadows, specifically Shadows over Bogenhofen. And uh, the last time I related this tale of these intrepid adventurers they had wrecked havoc on Schaffenfest and Schaffenfest is still going but other things have happened so the characters with their earnings party into the night they are staying at the ducal pavilion as the guest of Primus von Bildhof Bildhofen he is the son of the Grand Duke Leopold of Middenheim, and they are his guests. They stay in the pavilion. Um, there is a fun, a fun skill called consume alcohol in the game. So I just had everyone roll their consume alcohol and see how they did. One character did not do so well, so they were hung over when the watch came because this person, Dr. Malthusius, had accused them of robbery and assault, and they had to account for themselves. So the first part of the game was the characters willingly going uh, to the festival court to see what their punishment or their accusations against them were. And hey, they have a lawyer in their midst. One of the characters is actually, his career is a lawyer, and he was able to put together a good argument. I asked him to do what to say what he present his arguments. He did not have to do it role playing -y and acting wise. He kind of told me the logic behind his arguments. And then I had him roll and I had a target number in mind or bonuses in mind um, to give them. And it was an opposed role as Dr. Malthusius was arguing. And eventually our lawyer person did impress the judge and the judge decided to do not quite a punishment, but a reclamation of that three-legged goblin that had run away. And the characters were to earn not just five gold crowns from the city of Bogenhofen, but also the fine that Dr. Malthusius was to pay for holding a dreaded mutant, another five gold crown. But the, ca the catch was, the characters had to go find said goblin and where they were going to go they were going to supposed to go into the sewers because that's where the goblin darted into so the next part of the game was for the characters to explore the sewers under Bogenhofen and it was yummy to say the least actually the characters had decided you know to help with the hangover cure of the particular character they had found a an apothecary who <clears throat> gave them something to chew on so it would stop the nausea <clears throat> and they liked this apothecary her name was elvira i don't remember the last name it was something long and german sounding and hard to pronounce for me so they went uh, to the sewers they were led to a manhole because they couldn't get into the grate that the goblin had squeezed through uh, it's too small no halflings in the party this time around. So they went into the sewers. Uh, there is a wonderful mechanic on nausea and what kind of diseases you can catch and encounters. And actually the characters did pretty well. There were no crazy encounters down there. Um, there is a encounters occurred on a certain number rolled on the dice. And that really only happened once. They had an expert tracker who was the uh, elven knight, and he was able to track. They were able to backtrack their way to where the goblin entered the grate, find the tracks, and then 
track through the sewers and they were under there for a long time and um, rolling occasionally to see if they had contracted the disease of the sewers. Um, they didn't always trudge through effluent from the smaller pipes they had to. Um, so for sure they stunk, right? Um, and uh, we went through that relatively quickly. Again, there are no encounters, um, random encounters or the random encounter table for this particular part of the adventure. <clears throat> And uh, they found a couple interesting things while they were exploring. They found the body of the drunken dwarf they had rescued. Um, and, but it was odd and how, it was odd how he, how the body was placed. It didn't make sense. It was as if someone had tried to suggest that they were thrown down um, the manhole, but with some good examination of the way up into the manhole, it looked like it hadn't been opened in days and the body was relatively fresh. So why that was a mystery. They continued to follow the tracks of the three-legged goblin. It led to this uh, door that had bars on it, like a small window with bars on it. They couldn't quite see in. They, well, the mage character had, arri had arrived um, this time around. The player who plays the uh, wizard, who's a wizard of the Winds of Heavens, uh, was not available last time, but he was there, and he has a handy dandy uh, spell called "open," so he's able to open the bar door. They go in, and they see a blasphemous magical circle, uh, an octogram with the head of a beast inside, lined with copper. And as they take the scene in, a horror appears: a demon, a horror of zinch. If you know the lore, that's the Zinch is the um, chaos god of magic. And this horror appears. It uh, tries to scare them away. None of the characters were terrorized away. Uh, yes, there's meta currency. So um, I think initially two of the characters did not run away and made their fear check, even though it was at a penalty because of the horror of this creature. Um, and the other characters re-rolled their fear check and made it. So, um, which is pretty cool. They use their meta currency, which is always the goal of the GM to have them use their, down their, whittle down their meta currency until it becomes a critical and uh, then they don't have it anymore. So, and especially for the elven characters, the elven wizard and the elven knight, they actually have one reroll. Um, that's just the way it is because the, those characters are start more powerful, better stats. Uh, better chances of skills and, and talents and humans have can have multiple uh, re-rolls meta currencies because I guess fate and resolve is with them anyway the demon appeared and interestingly just as a side there's this one character the uh the one who plays the boatman who was once the villager who was the one who was the wrestling champion Ulrich the Unstoppable and he has his, he found this item somewhere along the way down on the river. It's, so there's this gray, heavy lead box that he's been carrying around that kind of whispers to him and is slowly corrupting him. Oh, and by the way, when they saw the demon, all the characters gained some corruption. It's gr funny and fantastic. So anyway, so there is a way in the game. Well, if you accumulate too much corruption, you start getting mutation. So the character was on the brink of having to roll to get a mutation. And then there is this mechanic that there's this way that you can get rid of dark mutations. If you, uh, something called, well, there's multiple ways, but one of the ways that you can get rid of mutations is succumb to something called dark whispers, which is basically uh, chaos uses you to do something. And I propose to the character that, well, the whispers tell you to go to that copper circle and try to scratch it scratch at it and deface it so that this demon can leave the confines of the room that they find themselves in. Because I think a lot of the characters wanted to run and they didn't want this demon to be freed. That was the main goal. So the character actually didn't know what to do initially and rolled a, like a random dice. And in their mind, they decided that the random dice of the result was that they decided to take the dark whispers, lose that corruption point, And then they tried to 
move to disrupt the circle. However, one of the other characters saw what was going on. Um, they had figured out that the copper inlay was part of the ritual to confine this creature. So that player had his character tackle this guy. And this is, I think, why the players always say this is like the best game ever. This is the funnest game to play and and why they keep coming back and why these recaps are so fun. And I was trying to think, why is it so? I mean, hilarity usually ensues, but it's through the course of play. It's not because something wacky or zany. And I think it's because the characters play serious and have this buy-in. And that is rewarded with fun gameplay and antics that just happen through the course and development of the game. So we have one player now wrestling with this other player, knocking his weapon out of his hand while the mage is like channeling magic. And another character is like running to get some clues that they had seen when they entered here before the demon quickly appeared. And the demon doesn't attack initially. It says, I just have to make you leave this place. And if you don't leave, well, bad things will happen. So with that character running in there, the demon attacks. And I just, my rolls were not with me. I was rolling, you have to roll below your value. And even though the demon had some skill in attacking, I was just rolling very high and missing. And that made the character running in there so happy. And also the wizard so happy because he was tr subtly trying to channel and bring to bear the power of heaven. And eventually the wizard did. And and I honestly, I'm afraid of wizards in this game because I don't know, they can be pretty powerful if played correctly. And the player running the wizard is a very savvy player. And, uh, but it wasn't so bad. I thought he would like one shot the demon with his spell, his like Tesla coil lightning bolt thing. And he injured the demon greatly, but did not destroy it. Which, and also, the, as a side note, a little bit of the electricity arced off uh, to the, one of the player characters, which was kind of a little funny. Didn't hurt him so much, but a little funny. Um, so I don't know if they're more scared of the lightning bolt that got fired or the, that the demon was not destroyed by it. Uh, meanwhile, they, another character joins in to help the elven knight um, knock the wrestler, boatman, villager, and you know, unconscious and into submission. They don't want to kill him. He's their buddy. Um, of, the, of the gray box that that player has that's causing this corruption and giving him these dark whispers, um, only two players in the group have seen the box. Uh, well, one player saw the box but told the wizard about it. So a couple players know about it. Anyway, eventually... The demon is defeated. It runs to attack the wizard, but I miss again. The wizard just blasts it again and destroys it. It returns to the realms of chaos in a puff of smoke and a pile of goo. So that was pretty neat. And the resolution, they found the clues that, that were in the room, a handkerchief with a monogram on it that was in a pool of blood, a sacrificial dagger, and a silver box. And what else did they find? Oh, and a scroll. Uh, the scroll was actually a, a scroll of lesser demon summoning. Um, so later on, the characters, actually what they do do is they do um, um, get out of the sewers. Half of them go straight away to the magistrate and the other half are like, I stink and smell like muck. Uh, it was funny that the wizard did try to climb out of there and rolled badly and fell and into the effluent. So, uh, interestingly, he gained an extra five experience points for that. It was just like in the book, the character falls down in the effluent. Well, they get five extra XP. It's funny. Anyway, the characters uh, get to the place where they're resting. They do let... Oh! When the character with who they beat up, who kind of tried to, to turn on them, was affected by the Dark Whispers, uh, before he came to, they took the box away. Again, while the player was a player's character was unconscious, they took the box away. 
they get back up. Some go to an inn um, to get cleaned up. Some go straight away to the magistrate to report where they're hosed down and washed down. And eventually everyone's in a bath and we're recovering. The character who had the box is going through withdrawals, is looking for the box. He tries to figure out who's lying to him. He feels like that the the one character who knew about the box was lying to him. So he goes to his room, starts pounding on the door, pounds on the door so hard that he knocks himself unconscious. Meanwhile, the wizard, knowing that it is a scroll of demon summoning, burns it, no problem, but then examines the box. The box is curious. It has dark elf writing on it, and he figures out how to open it. And the player, without any compulsion from me, I just asked him, are you going to open it or not? Decides to open it. And inside is some sort of demonic worm or caterpillar that says, I can give you great power. At this time, the character who was in, who had first found the box is shuddering in some sort of nightmare because the whispers are talking and reaching out. The elven knight has some ability to detect and sense bad things and magic and is like something something's around but I can't quite place it but the elven wizard is not compelled at this time is able to shake off and gird his will remain cool and closes the box before this demonic worm creature caterpillar grub thing can corrupt him further so we stop there. Uh, they have a mission now. They know that something demonic and foul and chaotic is going on in Bogenhafen. And they must uh, find out what that is. They have some clues. And we will pursue that next time in this tale of the enemy within, enemy in the shadows, Warhammer Fantasy, 4th edition. Listening to some of the podcasts from RPG A Day 2021 reminded me that I should add another little segment or an add-on, not an addendum, to the Warhammer Fantasy RPG 4 recap, and that uh, main, most of the conflicts we've been using Theater of the Mind today or yesterday was the first time I drew on our my little battle board um, and positioned everyone, because so I think the fight with a demon uh, was important tactically to know, to, for everyone to be on the same page. And everyone was cool with that. Like I said, normally we do theater, the mind with it. And there's been a lot of discussion about VTT and if it works or not. And I think some sometimes it has to. There's some people who are more visually inclined and some people who prefer theater, the mind. And I usually use an amalgamation of both. In the VTT, you have battle maps. Um, and there's some games that are more tactical. I would say like Pathfinder, Starfinder. And some that are less so and more narrative like Savage Worlds where you don't quite need a map. Although people have used maps with Savage Worlds. And for our Warhammer Fantasy, a lot of it is sort of talking and thinking. And I show I put up a picture on the Discord of what they see or what the character looks like or the map or whatever. And we go for it. But in this case, we had to use a little... Um, well, I didn't... I say I think just so we're on the same page because some craziness ensued. Um, as you heard... So it'd be, it was better that everyone knew visually what was going on, at least in my mind, so they could make their decisions. Um, anyway, that's how that went. Uh, a new introduction of Battle Map in the Warhammer game. Hi all, well that's going to be it for this episode. It is a not hashtag RPG Day 2021 episode. It is a regular episode, I would guess, but I wanted to really recap uh, the Warhammer Fantasy 4th Edition game that we've been playing and enjoying. <clears throat> and I would like to say, just as a little addendum, that a really cool book just came out for Warhammer Fantasy Archives of the Empire Volume 1. It talks about uh, elves, halflings, dwarfs, and it gives new career choices for those, including very coolly a halfling badger rider so if you've ever wanted to get your badger on gotta play warhammer fantasy and ride that badger like a halfling all right take care everyone and i'll talk to you soon